So, what did Bottas put in his porridge? Hey everybody, it's Spark, and welcome to today's uh, reaction video. We are, we've had the Portuguese Grand Prix qualifying. If you watched my um, last um, react videos before, then you guys will know the score for this one. I'm going to go from the top, which is uh, Mercedes, to all the way to the bottom, which is Williams, all based on the order in which they finished last year. Let's get straight into it. Let's talk about the big boys at Mercedes. Valtteri Bottas, after the tragic weekend he had in Imola last time where he collided with George Russell and was nowhere really in the race. This was exactly what he needed. To edge out Lewis Hamilton by seven thousandths of a second in a qualifying session that from, from what I could tell looked as if it could have gone anywhere. Like we all thought it was going to be a Verstappen v Hamilton battle but we know how good Valtteri is in qualifying. He came back, he delivered, He's now on pole position on a track that kind of like Sochi because it's quite kind, I think, to its tyres. It kind of suits Valtteri's driving style. He's certainly a contender for the win tomorrow if um, if Lewis doesn't end up pulling a brilliant move like he did last year on him. With Lewis Hamilton, of course, he would have wanted his 100th pole position, but he'll be happy to at least be ahead of Max Verstappen. His, um, his I think everyone in, Q in Q3 got caught out, but I think it was the wind picking up or something was changing in the track just so... They have well, they added on just um about nearly about seven to a seven tenths to a second worth of lap time. So after the lap in Q two that Hamilton put out on mediums, I really thought we could have been getting into the low one minute seventeens, but unfortunately the wind changing everything put an end to that. Well done Mercedes, great qualifying from them. So looking on to Red Bull right now, Max Verstappen, I think if you watch the um if you watch the coverage on Sky afterwards and how he, his reaction was, he's kicking himself really because this was his this was another chance that as soon as you're steamrolling another driver um like Lewis Hamilton so far when the momentum is with you, you cannot afford any slips, let alone 3 tenths of a second off pole position. He would have wanted to be on pole position just so he can continue to stamp his authority on the championship. Sergio Perez, on the other hand, this was a much, much better qualifying. I mean, compared to Imola, he ended up out qualifying Max Verstappen, which was, of course, a fantastic qualifying session. But looking at the way the second Red Bull drivers have performed, to only be a tenth behind Max was much, much better. I think what's what this is showing, that, um, looking outside of their program, is clearly working at the moment for Red Bull. Decent qualifying for Sergio to be right up there with Max, but... From Max's perspective, he would have easily wanted more, so not particularly strong for him. So now then, in my first sort of tale of two halves, we have McLaren. Lando Norris, another Q3 appearance. It was seventh though, he would have wanted to out-qualify both of the Ferraris, given that they're, they're the people that they're really in a fight with. But nevertheless, he looks as consistent as ever. Like he'd probably be aiming for about P5, that's probably the best he's looking to get if nothing happens to the top two teams. But then we get to Daniel Daniel Ricciardo. Unfortunately, the Honey Badger ended up, as far as qualifying concerned, looking up like roadkill. 16th place was not what he needed at all. Like we all know that he's he's got to take a little bit of a while to adjust to the car so he can bring out the performance out of it, just so he can do more to his liking. But this was a bad bad session for Daniel Ricciardo. I suppose there's only saving grace for him is that. He's got, he's got a choice of tyres to take into the next session. So safety cars, collisions, he'll be hoping for the whole lot. So moving on to further and longer, we have um, what was Racing Point is now Aston Martin. So much better from Sebastian Vettel in qualifying. To go, he's slowly come out the ranks. He went out in Q1 in Bahrain. He went out in, Q in Q2 at Imola. And now he finally got into Q3 for Portugal. So... On, by that virtue of itself, it's easily an improvement, but I don't know if you saw from the Sky footage that like he started his lap pretty much right on the back of Max Verstappen, so I don't think he was ever going to improve, unfortunately. But that was a, um, whether it was a miscalculation, maybe he could have got higher up the grid, I mean, potentially, he'd probably got around P7 or P8. But nevertheless, Sebastian Vettel, this was a much better um, qualifying session for him. Long may it continue. Lance Stroll, on the other hand, P17. I mean, it looks like one of those older performances from his uh, from his earlier um, days, where he was barely getting into Q2. And I'm not sure what the situation was with Lance. I know that Aston Martin were making a lot of noise about the regulations this year. With it's because it's a lower rate car, how that's affecting them in terms of performance. But Lance so far has been the more consistent and the higher performing of the two drivers. So I'm not quite sure what was up with him, but it was. Once again, not a particularly great qualifying for Lance Stroll. 
But we know that his race car is solidly improving race by race. I mean, we've seen that last year during some of his drives with Racing Point. With a, with a fight, really, I think with Alpine for a between sort of sixth and seventh place, not particularly great. Need, needed much more from Lance. And speaking of Alpine, I think for those of you who thought during practice there was a lot of pace there, that was certainly the case for Esteban Ocon. P6, right up there, fantastic result to out-qualify someone as Alonso, on the other hand, being P13 on the grid is not where he needed to be. I mean, compared to Esteban Knock-On, it looked like a very, very slow outing, but because of all the changes that were happening um, in Q3, I don't know, with the wind speed, with the um, tyres, I mean, Algarve, I think, is a particularly difficult track, but this... This was not, um, this is proving to be quite a mute comeback for Fernando Alonso to a point where you're kind of forgetting that he's there. And if it feels horrible to say about a driver with Alonso's calibre, but it just, was, it just wasn't a great performance. And he should be up there, I think, in Q3 more or less all the time. Like Wrangler, that, that thing to his last leg. We all know how good Fernando Alonso is at driving a bad car. Like I said, we all want more with somewhat with someone as as good as Fernando Alonso. Moving on to um, Scuderia Ferrari at the moment. That was both cars in Q3 again. Once again, this sort of solidifying the improvements that they made in between 2020 up until now. Carlos Sainz was the one actually who outqualified Charles Leclerc. So judging by performance of Q3 alone, brilliant job from Carlos Sainz. But the key difference between the two now is tire choices because. Carlos Sainz is starting on the softs, Charles Leclerc is starting on the medium. So unless Leclerc has an absolutely horrid start, I'd rather be sitting in his Ferrari than Carlos Sainz's at the moment. So effectively coming in um, at P5, which effectively best of the rest behind the Mercedes and Red Bull. Only just though, I mean, Ocon has clearly got a lot of pace in that Alpine over this weekend. So this is a very, um, very interesting session amongst the, um, the monster mid pack. It's almost like the midfield have almost been brought a little bit closer together simply by the nature of the track. But nevertheless, this was a, once again, a solid justification of the um, changes being made behind the scenes at Ferrari. They're, they got both cars into Q3. They're coming on the edge of about P3, P4 at the moment in the in terms of overall speed. So I would say, I think the pairing between the two, they've got the right blend of youth experience and longevity i mean the, these guys have got a lot to learn in the future but they've got enough experience i think between them to carry the team so once again decent qualifying session from ferrari so further down the grid we have alpha towery pierre gasly yet another q3 appearance from him once again showing that um he is just how great of an asset he is to the red bull um to the Red Bull program. He qualified P9, but after a set of disappointing races, that's what he's going to be looking at now because what he's had is had um, Bahrain where he took his front wing off and didn't end up scoring anything and Imola where he barely scored anything at all. This is, this he's got to capitalise now because Alpha Tauri have got a fast car but have had two races where they could have and probably should have achieved a little bit more. And Pierre really is the person to carry that forward at the moment. However, Yuki Tsunoda, P14, which doesn't look particularly great on paper, but like I said, I mean, I loved watching Yuki in Formula 2. I know how fast you can notice him be once he gets behind a car, so... And Formula 1 from Formula 2, even in itself, is quite a big gap because you have a lot more edge and modes or whatever and a lot more speed to play with, so it's going to take time. But I reckon Yuki Tsunoda, given a little bit of time, by the end of the year, we'll be seeing him as um, making a few more regular appearances in Q3. Now, moving on to Alfa Romeo. Now, this really was an encouraging performance from them, given that I felt that they were sort of at the top end of the lower midfield, or sort of like the eighth fastest team. Antonio G Giovinazzi, no other words to say it. Fucking brilliant qualifying. P12 as well, which is a... Real indication, probably if the Alfa Romeo is maybe it's starting to suit this track, but I think it's showing more and more about how the young Giovinazzi is coming of age, as opposed to the guy who spins at Spa and ruined up a chance at scoring points. But it's, come, it's coming a long way for Giovinazzi, so once again, fantastic qualifying from him. To out-qualify the more experienced Kimi Raikkonen, who I'm not quite sure what the issue was within Q2 for him, but he just didn't seem to quite have it together. The only real uh, marker um, with Alfa Romeo, along alongside the odd sort of 
Summer Williams is really finding a teammate at this point. This was this was around for Joe Venazzi. He's really showing how he's growing, particularly as a young driver. So now we're on to the back markers at Haas. We all knew they were going to be P19 and P20. And some of you out there, I think a lot of you, have um, probably knew which order they were going to be as well. Mick Schumacher, um, once again, outqualified his teammate, but... In a car like Hash, it's you just you're just not going to be able to make much of an impression. So every race is effectively a, a testing session here from now on. Nikita Mazepin, on the other hand, you didn't spin it. Good job. Anyway, moving on to Williams now. George Russell, so goddamn close. Five whole hundredths of a of a second between him and that and that elusive Q3 appearance. They call this guy Mr. Saturday for a reason. And there it is. To be P11 in a Williams that really is not going to see um, the fruits of its investments come in until um, until probably next year when the regulations change, showing once once more just how just what just what a brilliant talent the guy is. It's going to be um, sooner rather than later. He's going to be looking outside Williams, and I know there was talk about in practice that maybe he may be going to Aston Martin and Vettel doesn't deliver, but. Or maybe if Bottas doesn't deliver, he'll go straight to Mercedes. But um, once again, George Russell more more than likely outperforming the car. Nicholas Latifi, on the other hand, it wasn't it was it just wasn't his day. To put it simply, it was only P18. After what could have been a con really convincing show at Imola last time, he he needed more, especially when George Russell could put that car into 11th place. However, there's still loads to play for coming into the race. It was a so. Slightly new thing that I'm going to do for these videos is I'm going to do a set of predictions and then weigh them up in my next um, review when I do um, when I cover the race when that comes out. So I'm just going to keep into the top three at the moment. So if you look to the left of my screen, you will see my top three there. I reckon Lewis Hamilton he's he's going to get P1. He'll he'll outdo Valtteri somehow. Bottas, I think he's got it in him to finish ahead of Max Verstappen, which will give Lewis a pretty decent buffer in the world title. Max Verstappen, I see him taking P3 right now, unless Perez obviously delivers something absolutely amazing. But they're my top three. Right, so I'm playing it safe and it doesn't look like I think there's going to be a lot of rain. I'm not sure what the talks of it were, but those are my top three. At the moment. So, what about you? What are your thoughts on qualifying, and what is your what is your predictions going into the race tomorrow? Be sure to let me know in the comment section below. And if you like the video, if you like um, Formula One season and gaming content, then be sure to like the video, hit that subscribe button for more content. I've been Spark Six Six Six. You've been brilliant. Thank you so much for watching. See you all later.